Okay, and we're ready. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the presentation of the third issue of Manifest, a journal of the Americas, issue that this time is devoted to the bigger than big. I'm Mariana, and we are in at Spazio in Milan. I'm delighted that uh, Dan Handel and Anthony Ashavati are here today uh, to introduce uh, today's uh, conversation. Uh, I met uh, Dan uh, 10 years ago in Montreal at the CCA. Uh, he had just uh, been awarded the inaugural uh, Young Curator Fellowship, and he was uh, working on a small but uh, memorable exhibition titled uh, First the Forest. Uh, he kept working on the subject, he wrote articles, and he curated a second exhibition um, titled The Wood at the Het Neue Institute in Rotterdam. Uh, he is now working on a book that will uh, bring together these uh, 10 years of research. And in the meantime, he completed a PhD. He has been the curator of architecture and design at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. He has participated to the Venice Biennale, and he has started a new research uh, about uh, interior spaces and uh, carpets. And I believe he will soon um, have uh, another memorable show at the CCA in the fall. Uh, I met Anthony, the editor, uh, a few years ago when, he, when I got back his notes on a text that I wrote for Manifest. And it's always exciting when you get to work with uh, editors that are committed, uh, as committed as you are, um, to turn uh, an okay draft uh, into an interesting text. Authors uh, tend to have an ego, so it's not an easy job to ask uh, the right questions, uh, to suggest uh, different references, and to uh, push to rewrite and do better. Uh, then I got to meet Anthony, the author, when I read his uh, book, uh, Ganges uh, Water Machine, that we have here in front. Uh, he spent a decade um, visiting the Ganges uh, River Basin and doing research on the topic. And if you are even remotely interested in the topic, you should really read his book because it is really a very compelling research. Uh, Anthony is uh, the current uh, Daniel Rose uh, Visiting Assistant Professor at Yale University, and he's working on a new book titled uh, Building a Republic of Villages that will be released in 2022. In 2011, uh, Dan, Anthony, and uh, Justin Fowler uh, founded Manifest to advance uh, um, thoughts on the built environment of the Americas. And I will let now Dan and uh, Anthony introduce uh, the third issue of Manifest, uh, today's topic, and uh, our guests, Giovanna Silva and uh, Colleen Tuit and Ian Quaid. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Anthony. And thanks also to Tal Eres for uh, designing this virtual uh, presentation and uh, making sure that we look smart. Thanks. Thank you for that most kind introduction, Mariana. Uh, you know, uh, with a journal like Manifest, we're only as good as the writers that we publish. So it's really wonderful to uh, hear you say that. And of course, we're incredibly lucky to have you as one of the 50 contributors along with Ian and Colleen. And it's great to have the chance to have a remote launch of Manifest number three with a focus on description and lighting out for the territory here at Spazio. This is our first launch outside of the Americas, and it's truly great to be in Milano. And a big thank you, as always, to Tal Erez, uh, a designer and artist based in Tel Aviv, as Mariana was mentioning, who is producing this event and to whom we are extremely grateful. And many thanks to all of you for joining us for this event. This is the fourth of many launches that we will be doing with upcoming events in Argentina, Mexico City, Cambridge, New York City, Halifax, Lima, and many others. And so what we'd like to do today is really begin by sketching out what Manifest is, which is to say that, as uh, Mariana alluded to, Manifest is an independent print journal dedicated to the art, architecture, and landscapes of the Americas. It was founded by myself, along with Dan Handel and Justin Fowler, to initiate what we hope is a critical and imaginative conversation about the Americas. And we've been described by some as the first literary journal of architecture. And we rather like this description 
because for us, Manifest provides an opportunity for placing historical work in dialogue with contemporary subjects, projective tracks, and admitted fictions. We really see the journal is as much a venue for literary experimentation as analytical investigation. And we have been very fortunate to receive support from the Graham Foundation, along with anonymous donors and, and benefactors, as well as from a readership that extends across the globe from Thailand to Peru and from Canada to Indonesia. And while we maintain an active online presence and you can find out more about our issues on our website, we remain fiercely committed to print as a medium of exchange of ideas and experiences. Our first two issues focus respectively on definitions of Americanness in the built environment and on the complex theme of religion and space throughout the Americas. Issue number three, for which we're here to chat about today, titled Bigger Than Big, focuses on the physical dimension of the continent, its landscapes and its material imaginaries. And it is why this uh, evening we are gathered to reconsider this bigger than big, to ask in short, what does it mean to grapple with the immensity of the Americas? Issue number three provides some clues to that question and perhaps appropriately is our largest issue yet with 50 contributors and 280 pages. Um, in that context, our deliberate use of the term Americas requires uh, to us further significance. Of course, the stuff of the continent transcends political borders, which expands our horizon from the plains of Patagonia to the Arctic Circle. But the term also connotes the multiplicity that exists within a given territory. A sort of uneasy layering of environments, as we see, people's ideologies that cannot be summarized in, a, in an executive brief of presidential campaigns, but has to be excavated, reflected upon, and constantly imagined. So uh, Light Out for the Territory, as you probably know, uh, which is our title for today, is the final sentence from the book Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain, to which the protagonist expresses his contempt for the civilities of modern society and ventures to leave it all behind for the sake of the unknown. Huck is no romantic. If you read the book, you know it well. He doesn't expect to find divinities in the Sierra Nevada or gold in the American River. He's simply moving on to the next exploration in a manner that only a poor boy could afford. Of course, not all of the explorers of the American continent were so well intended, many bringing along with them enslavement, destruction, and pathogens. But the sober process of setting out into the great out there and seeing it for what it is uh, opens up new ways of understanding the territory. It is a tradition we wish to invoke in our conversation today. So for this afternoon, uh, we have asked our speakers to show their own journeys into the American uh, into American matter, as we like to call it. Uh, Giovanna Silva will discuss uh, her work on American deserts and uh, her journeys uh, uh, alone and together with others into these uh, areas of the continent. And landscape designers out of uh, other fields, Colleen Tuit and Ian Quaid, will retrace their gonzo journeys into oil booms and geological time. Anthony and I will then moderate a short conversation on modes of exploration, the power of description, and American immensity. So to that end, I'd like to introduce our panelists uh, briefly with the bios they shared with us. Other Fields is an experimental activist-directed landscape studio led, led as, we, as I said before, by Ian Quaid and Colin Tuit. Their work is aesthetic and unorthodox, seeking new methods to transform industrial landscape materials into provocative living spaces. Giovanna Silva lives and works in Milan. From 2005 to 2007, she contributed to the magazine Domus, and from 2007 until 2011, she was photo editor of the magazine Abitare. She published, uh, that's a long list of uh, publications, so I'll do my best. Uh, she published uh, Imodific, Tehran, uh, 17 April 1975, a Cambodian, a Cambodian journey, Afghanistan, ORH, I hope I'm doing it right, Syria, a travel guide to disappearance, Foxtrot Gate, uh, Cyprus, Libya, uh, inch by inch, house by house, alley by alley, Baghdad, red zone, green zone, Babylon uh, by Moose Publishing, uh, you and Bruno, uh, near my forever, uh, Palmera, art paper by art paper editions, walk like an Egyptian, good boy, um, by Motor Books and Mr. Bauer, I presume, by Hatekans. She participated at 14 uh, architectural exhibition in Venice with her project Night Swimming, 
discotheques in Italy from mm, 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 the 60s to the present, but also published by Bedford Press. Um, she's the founder of Humboldt Books and San Rocco Magazine. Um, so please, I think we'll start with Giovanna today. Uh, and please welcome you all and thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for the introduction with all the list of all my books. <laughs> I'm compulsive. I, I love books, so I published a lot of books in the last 10 years. Today, I will present uh, two projects uh, related to my different personalities, but related to one place, America. Uh, I need babe, maybe to do a little introduction why I mentioned two personalities. I'm not dangerous, uh, just I love books. So I founded a, a publishing house, Humboldt Books. But also, uh, I work as an artist making my own books with other publishers. Uh, the first project I present tonight is a book um, published by Humboldt Books, Absolutely Nothing is the title of the book. Uh, Humboldt Books is a publishing house devoted to travel experience. We work with writers, photographers, artists on the idea of travel. We have a specific series of books where we involve a writer and a photographer, and the writer choose a place and we choose the photographer who is the right one for this place. We publish a book about Ethiopia, one about Greece, one about Iceland, and the last one of this series is about US. The writer is Giorgio Vasta. All the books, uh, unfortunately, are in Italian. Um, and when we start to talk about our journey through the southern states of North America, Giorgio Vasta wanted to visit ghost towns. But what is a ghost town? Uh, it was my question to Giorgio. The trip was uh, to be from Los Angeles to Houston, visiting places abandoned for different reasons as old west villages, uh, cities from as Southern Sea, which is, was abandoned because of an ecological problem. Other sites were abandoned because the people were forced to leave. And we involved also a photographer, uh, Francesco Iodice, that is one of the most famous uh, architectural and landscape photographer in Italy. And um, together with him, we plan our trip. We wanted to visit some military areas and abandoned airports like uh, Davis Moan in uh, Arizona. So places for which we need permissions. But the day before our flight, Francesco broke his leg. So I panic. And then I remember then when I used to work at Domus Magazine, there was a photographer, Ramak Fazel, who lived for 15 years in Milan and then moved back to LA. So I called Ramak and I say, Ciao Ramak, uh, how are you? Long time no see. I changed my life because at that time I was working as a photographer for Domus and I founded a publishing house. Tomorrow I will be in LA. Do you have 20 days to come with us on a trip uh, in the US? And Ramak agreed. And the day after he picked up uh, us at the airport dressed in shorts and a uh, Hawaiian uh, shirt. And uh, we went from Los Angeles down to Bombay Beach, that is in the south of California, up to Las Vegas, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas. And uh, we were supposed to stop in Houston, but then we decided to drive until uh, New Orleans. Um, I'm talking about this book because from a, an editorial point of view, it has been really important and it has been also a shift in the narration. I mean, Humboldt books uh, focus on travel narrative and nowadays it's not easy to write about travel experience. Um, we publish five books and every writer approached this team in a different way. For instance, Vincenzo Latronico, uh, who wrote about Ethiopia, wrote a kind of diary, even if it's not in a chronological order, but uh, mixing personal memories with our trip because his mother was born in Ethiopia as many other Italians after the Second World War and then left Addis Abeba after the Dead Revolution in 74. So Vincenzo grew up uh, surrounded by all these stories about Ethiopia, but he had never been there. So he first visited the country with us. When we came back from US, Giorgio, the writer, called me and he asked me if he could use me and Ramak, the photographer, as characters. In a way, emphasizing um, our personalities and transforming us in characters. So from one side, uh, Ramak turned out to be half way in between George Clooney, because he looks a bit like George Clooney, and Peter Sellers in Hollywood Party. And I was half way between Lutefig von Drake from Disney characters and the pizza. And of course, the book is based on true facts, because we 
we, we made the trip, but uh, we had to, and we also had two accidents, all caused by the naivete of Ramak. In that way, he, he looks a bit like Peter Sellers in Hollywood Party, but also the kind of accident that completely changed our trip in a positive way. And yes, I knew everything during the trip because I organized the trip. I was the producer, so I had to give them orders and deadlines because they were acting like, like children. Um, of course, changing our personality or let them bigger than uh, they were, we became characters. And from a narrative point of view, the, uh, this transformed the book from nonfiction to a fiction. We became protagonists of a novel, but all the facts really happen. And I think this is very interesting from my point of view as a publisher, how a writer uh, changed the perspective, perspective of travel narratives. And our car, for, for example, um, broke down in Bombay Beach, so in the south of California, and we slept in a, an RV with an old and very kind lady. Uh, we crossed uh, the border to Mexico by mistake, and we were stopped for nine hours for controls. We entered in the Museum of Roswell in New Mexico, a museum devoted to UFO, and we met again by chance ZZ Top, the singer. So I think all these facts together uh, really looks like a fiction, but it wasn't. Um, uh, I'm not supposed to say this, but this book is my favorite one about all the production of Humboldt. Also, um, because it marked the beginning of a great friendship, we are now working all together on a book about Palermo because Giorgio is from there and Ramak came to visit us. And I'll start sharing also my screen to show you some pictures that Ramak took. Um, the, the trip uh, was in 2013 and the book was published in 2016. I have to say Giorgio wrote a, a wonderful novel, but it's, he's very, very slow. So. Now we are waiting for the Palermo one, probably in the next years. And um, one second, that I have to understand. All the pictures Ramak took, uh, he took with a Rolleiflex, so a six by six camera. So also the way of dealing with people during the trip was very interesting to me as a photographer, in this case, not as a publisher, because if you have a Rolleiflex with a, a huge flash, of course, you have to talk to the people before taking pictures. And also the fact that he was using flashes also uh, with daylight, this makes uh, also a shift in, in the pictures because you can't recognize if it was night or day. All the pictures are in, on, with the same light that was the flashlight of Ramak. Giovanna, uh, sorry to interrupt. Could you just put it on a full screen so we can see the photos yes. better? Uh, One second. Uh, like this. Do you see in full screen now? Mm, no. No? You might have to share again. Share is post. Resume share. Yes, you're right. You're always right. Stop share, one second. Now? Yes, Thank perfect. You. The place in the photographs are all abandoned, more or less, these are Costanti that is not abandoned. We, of course, stop also in other places. And um, this is very important. First, because it's, uh, it takes me to the second book that I will present tonight. Uh, but also become, because this is one of the things that struck me the most of traveling around the US, sorry. Um, it's such a, a huge country that you can drive for hours without meeting anyone. This explains the title of the book, Absolutely Nothing. And here comes the possibility to abandon place and leave everything there as it was. Uh, we don't have empty spaces in Europe, especially in Italy. Uh, if you travel around, as I'm doing now, as I'm stuck here in my country, you never have the feeling that of all this nature, of this huge spa uh, space full of leftovers. Um, of course, uh, mainly you focus on, not on the landscape, but uh, on details of the people and the places we visited. Um, 
And for me, it was from one side, a really, really an adventure because we enter in abandoned house and you can't, I mean, I have vague memories when I was five to have this feeling of entering in abandoned places, but in Italy, it's really complicated. And then also the way uh, Ramak could deal with people, Giorgio less because he, he doesn't speak English and also is more shy in terms of personality. And, and also in the composition of the structure of the book, since uh, it's a series of books, so there is a specific layout and um, the photographer in each book has only 32 pages. And normally uh, the, the other photographers that were Armin Link and Marina Balosharmeda, that is an, another Italian photographer, they gave us uh, just 32 images, one for each page. And then Ramak had so many pictures, he took so many pictures that it was impossible for us to show the whole trip just with 32, page, uh, 32 pictures. So uh, we decided to print on the book with a different layout, use the format of six by six uh, Rolleiflex camera. So the images are a lot, but they're very small in the book. So I'm happy I can share with you the full screen mode because uh, I think are beautiful. And, and also for me, it was interesting because as a photographer, I'm going with them and I'm taking pictures of the authors in, during the making of the, the book uh, because sometimes the, uh, the, the writer has to use like a specific image. And of course, I don't want to ask to the photographer, let's take that pictures because probably the writer will write about this. So I'm there as second photographer. And when we came back to Italy, com uh, compare my photographs with Ramak are completely different. So one day I will be back and uh, I'll do the same uh, trip again with Ramak. And I think this is one of the last one because now we the landscape changed and we were supposed to stop in Houston, but then Ramak says, okay, let's go and uh, reach also New Orleans. So then we have to go back to Houston. This is in the um, uh, Museum of Roswell and this is the top that we met. <laughs> of course, I didn't recognize him, but the guys were so excited that we met someone in that museum. The second book is completely different, and um, but in a in a way, it's fair. Now that I had to do this presentation, I understood that it's very very related to the first to the book. Absolutely nothing. Um, the book actually is a reissue of a book of mine from two thousand seven. Uh, at that time, I used to work for the Mus magazine, and I had the chance to travel with the Italian designer Enzo Mari uh, in the desert of US from Los Angeles to Las Vegas and Palm Springs. The idea of the article that we had to do was to collect the leftovers that we could find in the desert and transform them into objects. My role was a mix of chaperon, driver, translator, and photographer. Of course, now I can see the experience as a great opportunity and the beginning of another uh, great friendship between me and Enzo. My idea is the, um, that travel is the easiest way to become friends forever or enemies forever. Um, and we became really close friends. He passed away last October. And for that, I decided also to republish the book. Um, when I, I published the first issue of the book, I was 27. Um, and so I decided to publish just pictures of the trip together. Now um, the, the first edition went sold out. And also I think I'm more skilled in um, the conception of the book itself. So I decided to add the transcription of the mini, seven mini DV I recorded when, while we, I was driving with him. So the concept of the book is very easy. From one side, there are the pictures I took. And from the other side, there are the transcription of our talks during the trip and some frames of um, the mini DV that of course are not high quality, but I think give an idea of the trip together. And um, recollection in, uh, let's say, random order, 
Mari Atred for American General, a typical European prejudice that he brought with him along with suitcase. America represent all the evils of, of the world. That mission that America did, however, managed to come up with two different design objects, the dollar, which was, uh, has remained largely unchanged, and the highways, linking such a vast territory like threads cast into the void. His discovery at quite a late, a late age of Sprite, the, the sweet water, and his ensuing abuse of it. And uh, his curious gaze out of the car window, the cabin space filling up with cigar smoke to form a dense fog, and the likes of which were unheard of even back in famously foggy Milan. And um, I want to read some of the transcription because I think his voice it is definitely better and wiser than mine. Um, I just pick three quotes of the transcription. We fence off the desert and it can only be entered on foot. This is the first one, really dramatic. Uh, up until 50 years ago, we were capable of living in nature, of controlling it, both physically and perceptively. There is this tremendous lie in the world about technology. Technology is blind. Any object that surrounds us, if it's break, if it snaps, we are completely powerless. Even someone who has five Nobel Prize is completely powerless. There are such rarefied fragments of intelligence, so separate from everything else, that none of us are capable of managing them together. We have to go back to square one using desert as metaphor. The desert is full of things. Let's try and list them. There is empty space, which is still a thing. There are all the rocks which have their form that it is. First, they were broken up by prehistorical wind and rain. Then there are animals in this area. You can't, um, you can't see all the boros holes of the various anim little animals that live here, or at least we are unable to identify them. Then there are the plants, these being fighting for their own survival. These plants are ethical. Their problem is surviving, waiting for any unlikely rainfall, which would allow them to blossom and spread their seed. And so continue the battle for survival in this place. The nothingness in our culture is something that can easily be used. We have lost the ability to fight for existence. Nothingness is a concept relative to our way of being. There are many, many more uh, quotes, but I will end with this. That is also the other side of a trip, like the funny moment um, that I share with Ensomari. He was on the phone with uh, his daughter that is almost my age, and he was describing the desert. It's boundless. You see a huge desert. Then you drive on and drive on and on, and you cross a mountain range, and then there, are, there is another one and another, and you come to yet another one. I mean, you just imagine from Liguria to Venice, including Tuscany down to Rome, taking in a bit of Austria and Switzerland too, all desert with different colored mountains, minerals, animals, snakes. I sleep in motel in the desert. Apart from moving, moving around, taking photos and writing the four Kantian categories of being, this is what we do. We gather findings, bits of rock. I'll probably come back with 10 kilos of material. And then you will probably the daughter asked about us because I was there with also with a journalist and he was smiling, looking at us and say, yeah, they're a pa pair of dickheads, but very nice guys. And this was my experience briefly with Ensomari. Maybe then we can also start a discussion later, but I think now it's time for another presentation. So I stop sharing my screen and... Thank you so much, Giovanna, for this uh, uh, intro into uh, your projects. And I think we'll have uh, many things to talk about. But first, uh, we'd like to see other fields uh, speak and talk about their, uh, their own exploration. So please, Ian and Colleen. Thanks, Dan. Good 
Can you all see my screen? Not yet. All right. Maybe let's take a minute like last time. Okay. There we go. Here it is. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Ian Quaint, and um, that's Colleen's also on the call. Um, and good evening or afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from. Um, as Dan mentioned, we are an experimental activist-led uh, landscape studio. And uh, we have a longstanding fascination with industrial um, undesigned spaces um, from both the sheer scale of their interventions to the unusual and unexpected spaces they produce. Um, in several previous uh, contributions to Manifest, we have explored um, using the language of landscape architecture and geology uh, to describe the culture and experience of obscure locations uh, in America, often encountering these industrial and manufactured landscapes, uh, but in a diversity of ecologies. So for Bigger Than Big, we explored the Bakken shale play. Um, so this map shows all of the shale deposits in the continental US. And this arrow is pointing to the Bakken shale play in North Dakota. So the Bakken shale play is one of the largest deposits in the United States. And it's named after this farmer named Henry Bakken, uh, where the deposit was discovered. Um, it's thought of that most of these shale uh, deposits come from dinosaurs in the popular imagination, but they actually come from plankton. Um, so as you can see in this map, which is from about 350 million years ago, North Dakota is approximately here where the green arrow is in a shallow ocean um, where plankton is constantly being deposited. Um, today, uh, the formation looks uh, something like this and it is buried now. Um, 350 million years later under two miles of uh, deposit of, of dirt <laughs> and other, other layers. Um, some of those layers are shown here. And as you see in the hatching, I'm just gonna dig into the geology for a second and then we'll zoom out. Um, as you see in the hatching, we have three members to the uh, Bakken formation. There are two shales, the upper Bakken and the lower Bakken, and then a middle sandstone. And all of them have, um, have uh, carbon deposits, but the sandstone, uh, the sort of juicy center, if you will, are what um, petroleum geologists are after. And that middle section is about 45 meters thick. Um, so in uh, the middle 2000s due to um, the rising cost of oil and new technologies, particularly uh, horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing, AKA fracking, um, this Bakken deposit suddenly became um, economically feasible to develop. And so there was an explosion uh, both in petroleum development and in geologic research and that um, kind of sitting on our desks uh, in New York City is what prompted Colleen and I to explore it. Okay. Um, so yeah, so as you know, Ian mentioned around 2008, um, these kind of these factors start to come together, both the geology of the place of this like large scale oil deposit um, and then also the economic factors and technology. So hydrofracking and in 2008, the um, financial crisis within the United States. So the financial crisis caused um, like oil and gas prices to rise exponentially. And then also um, uh, people that were losing their jobs and their houses at the same time. So suddenly the Bakken becomes um, this kind of beacon that then that then boomed. Um, so Ian, do you want to play the video? 
It's a vast area of land with huge opportunity for oil drilling, but production costs have kept companies from drilling in the Bakken oil formation in West recently when oil prices started to skyrocket. Um, so there's both kind of like in the, um, starting to kind of enter the new stream and then on the right or the next video in terms of like social media, um, Ian, go ahead. Oh. Hold on. That's how we doing it out here, y'all. That's how we making it happen. Just making it rain, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Welcome to North Dakota, the land of the money. Um. So yeah, this kind of idea of both investment and economic promise, and then also as uh, a place for jobs, um, particularly for people that had maybe uh, lost their job in an economic crisis and or couldn't find a job where they lived elsewhere in the United States. Um, so, but at the same time as this kind of economic aspiration, um, a picture of the on the ground reality uh, was emerging. So such as this like Bakken uh, fail Facebook group um, and like social media hashtags um, that kind of showed both like the danger and like very unregulated conditions um, that these guys showing up from all over the country faced, but then also kind of laughing about it and like creating this uh, very kind of bizarre frontier culture. Um, so next. So by 2013, um, all these kind of forces are coming together and the strain on local infrastructure was apparent. Um, we began reading about uh, spontaneous communities called man camps um, that were forming where people would live out of their cars in Walmart parking lots because um, that there was essentially no housing um, for all the workers that were coming, uh, descending into North Dakota. Um, at the time, the cost, of li or the cost of housing in North Dakota was higher than New York City. Um, so th this guy, uh, Greg Zart, um, has kind of an amazing series on YouTube, um, sort of advising newcomers how essentially to be homeless. Um, so like where you can park your car, like. Uh, which McDonald's has free Wi-Fi and uh, how not to freeze to death. So, Ian. We're gonna show you, we're gonna show you today, Sarah. We're gonna show you how to survive in zero below temperatures right here in Williston, North Dakota with no place to go with your vehicle, with just one extension cord, one face heater. So yeah, that, that's the vibe. Um, so this is kind of the situation we had been following for a few years and, um, and yeah, and in 2015, we finally got it together and made our trip. Um, so here's the view as you fly into Minot. Um, Minot is the, um, the airport in, um, in the Bakken formation of uh, North Dakota. So it's a tiny airport that's been like, that's now like, um, like everything else sort of like serving way more people. Um, and so from the view out the window, you can see this like kind of what the landscape it, it starts to become. So it's like this agricultural um, grid that then becomes enmeshed with some of the geologic features that, um, that Ian was talking about. Um, okay, so yeah, so here we are. <laughs> um, shout out to uh, fellow traveler, Katie Foley um, in the back seat. Um, so we did a lot of driving. Um, the plan was to kind of circumnavigate around the, um, the formation. So starting in North Dakota, we actually ended up like a little bit north into Saskatchewan and then like wrapped back around. Um, so the landscape kind of becomes, it's agricultural, but then it becomes more and more sort of like dotted with um, sites of oil production. So, um, as you can see here, there's like both the pump jacks and then um, on the right uh, sites where they're drilling um, for hydraulic fracking. Um, I also want to mention that we like 
sort of approach these very much, even though we're like interested in the science and the geology behind it, we definitely approach the trip in a kind of open-minded way and um, kind of more as like artists and designers. Um, so we try to come in, even though like something like this, where you like understand it's very sort of environmentally fraught um, and politically and socially as well. Like we try to just come into it very open-minded and just to like, see what it's like. Um, so this, deep time, um, if you will. Okay. Um, so, uh, so this was kind of the view of many of the towns we passed through. Um, essentially they're being expanded and rebuilt to accommodate this like heavy flow of materials. Um, at the time in 2015, um, that region was unconnected via pipelines. So everything coming in and out was either on trucks or oil trains. Um, you can also see these kind of like new housing developments cropping up in like pretty random places. Um, however, housing is still a problem. So speaking of housing, our first <clears throat> scheduled stop was at the Bear Paw Lodge, which is a man camp. Um, Bear Paw Lodge has a capacity for approximately 500 workers and it was nearly full when we visited. And it represents this kind of like <clears throat> um, petroleum age uh, nomadism where the woman that was showing us who she was managing the, the lodge lived in California. And so she would work six, six weeks on, fly back to California where she lived. And there were a lot of folks that had this like kind of crazy, um, crazy migration. Um, so this one, this Bear Paw Lodge was um, owned by Halliburton and it is indeed the same, um, same unit, same design, same specs as what they deploy in Iraq and other war zones. And it's also what the Olympic Village is made out of. Um, so here we are cruising through um, some of the gear um, and kind of more of the front end, the receiving, and then when you get to more of the social spaces, uh, it looks more like this. Um, hopefully everyone can read the, um, the signs on the wall. It's like custom artwork. So it's like after your fracking, come on in and rack them. Um, there's all these kind of like corny uh, custom artwork. It's, it really makes you wonder what's on the walls in Iraq. Like, is there special like jokes? I don't know. Um, but yeah, this was kind of the, the vibe of the place. Um, and, and also uh, the company store was like very much also in the same spirit. Uh, it's like energy drinks and cigarettes, um, kind of, yeah. Um, so, okay, so in contrast to the sort of like transitory labor aspect of the boom, um, the environmental consequences are potentially more long lasting. Um, so here's another drill site and then retention waters for wastewater. Um, the fracking process um, uses like uh, millions of gallons of pressurized fresh water. Um, that to that's like driven into the ground um, to like crack the shale and release the oil. Um, however, once this water comes back out, it's contaminated and radioactive. Um, so it's a big problem what to do with this water. Um, so one solution is to re-inject it into the ground, which is like, okay, I don't know. Uh, but uh, in practice, we were told it usually get, get or it can get dumped. Um, so yeah, it's a big problem. Um, and yeah, even though the, the scale of the landscape is quite vast, um, the industry is really pervasive. So here's a view from the North unit of Theodore Roosevelt National Park. And dotting the horizon, you can see um, drill sites. Um, Uh, there's also herds of bison, um, which makes this kind of very surreal experience of, of ancient and, and modern. Um, so this, 
The, the other kind of huge issue um, environmentally is the flaring of natural gas. Um, so natural gas is brought up with the oil, um, but it's uh, too expensive, at least in the minds of the um, oil companies to capture it. So something like 35% of the natural gas is just burned off. Um, and it goes like straight into the atmosphere, which is basically like crack for uh, climate change. Um, uh, however, uh, it made for a very kind of beautiful, surreal experience um, at nighttime. So this was something that very much, um, yeah, we found there are a lot of tension in terms of both uh, the sort of um, industrial processes that are taking place in the landscape, but also some of the phenomena that like accompanied it was actually quite beautiful. Um, yeah. And then a quick epilogue. Um, So uh, in 2016, um, there was the protest in Standing Rock uh, against the pipelines. Um, and then uh, in 2020, um, now the um, kind of like post COVID, uh, there's been a bust in terms of the um, of oil prices and thus of the whole kind of operation. Um, Ian, did you want to add a few more words in here? Well, I think just just to sort of tie back to how you know we were getting started, where you know we're interested in um, in industrial uh, in the material industrial materials and how um, industrial things can be um, kind of reimagined to be more uh, to be more alive and to be more at a human scale, because I think this this is going to be a, a an increasingly common condition where we have these booms that are so fast that are tailored to uh, a, lar a scale on the inhuman size that need to, been, need to then be adapted uh, and retrofitted to, to be places where people can actually live and uh, for, for longer than six weeks at a time. So that's, that's kind of where, um, where we're at. Okay. So I'm going to stop here. <laughs> Thank you for those uh, fantastic presentations, both uh, Giovanna and uh, Ian and, and Colleen. Um, I have so many questions that I'd like to ask uh, the three of you, but uh, I think I only get maybe one or two maximum. So uh, I'll, I'll be very quick and maybe I'll start with, uh, with Giovanna. Um, you know, I, I, I couldn't help but think about asking you to speak about the role of photography and the role that that uh, plays in your encounters with new territories, which may seem like an incredibly obvious question, but I kept thinking, given the range of visually striking books on travel that you've produced and that you've shared uh, with us today, I couldn't help but think about the way in which, um, say, the work of uh, the photographer Alan Sekula has been described in Fish Story, where right, he's kind of tracking global production patterns and, and, and consumption, kind of from uh, point of origin to point of uh, consumption. Uh, the, his work has been described as being at once like uh, discursive or contextual, meaning that there's obviously a kind of fiction that's at play within it, because you can never really grapple with the whole territory of the immensity of something. And on the other hand, they're uh, referential, meaning they're also like records of complex uh, material conditions. And so I, what I thought was fascinating about the, the work that you shared um, uh, from the two books was the way in which there's clearly a kind of way in which one has to develop, it seems, a narrative through photography to en engage the immensity of a, of a place, but also then the complexity of those material conditions. So I'd just love to hear more about how you negotiate that, because you also do that with, you, you don't do that alone in the two that you showed, it's you're with other people doing that work. Yes, it's a um, difficult question because uh, I have to start from my own work as a photographer. Uh, I, I'm a photographer by chance because I study architecture and my 
dream was to be a writer, but I don't have the <laughs> the um, the talent of being a writer. So I mostly use my uh, photographs as a um, way to describe places and to narrate story. That of course, as always, um, are seeing as no non-fiction. I mean, I don't use uh, photographs to tell stories that are not true. I'm done before mention all the books I publish. Uh, that's in the title of that series of book I, I publish with the most publishing, a publishing house based in Milan, are narratives as the um, travel <coughs> narratives of uh, uh, explorer in the late 18th century. And my idea was to show uh, war places because I started with um, Iraq and for that I understand when Ian was telling us that those, that place looks exactly as the place in Iraq, and then Afghanistan, Libya. And for each book, I choose a different way to describe the situation after the war. So for instance, in the book about Libya, I choose, sorry, <coughs> all the buildings and the monument of Gaddafi destroyed during the last revolution of the revolution in 2011. In Afghanistan, I focus more on the military army. It's true that then the process of editing, so um, when uh, you are taking pictures in a war places, of course, you have to be really quick and I use digital cameras. So I, when I came back in, I, I come back in, uh, in Italy, I spent a lot of time on, on the editing. And I think in a way the editing of all the material is where you can add a, a bit of fiction in photographs. It's also true that when I started uh, working as a publisher, also my idea of a photography um, as a picture of reality changed a bit because I understood working with writers and photographer in the same place and in the same way because all these trip uh, to Ethiopia, to Greece, to Iceland, and then to US were made together, me, the photographer and the writer. So we were there at the same time. That is true that the writer in a way has this uh, possibility of narration and of course of fiction, but also the photographer can use uh, the narration of his own editing as a story that has a different meaning from reality. It's also tricky for me because as a publisher, I understand that I have a clear point of view of what the book has to be. So sometimes I help artists and writers in doing books. Sometimes for them, I'm a huge present in the room because of course I have my own idea of what I would like to do. And sometimes I think I force them in my way because I'm the publisher. So, but of course I also learn a lot from them. So. I'm always trying to mix my own ego with them. Um, and perhaps if we uh, follow up on that and turn to Colleen and Ian. Uh, so as you mentioned in all three uh, issues of Manifest, we had the good fortune of, uh, of publishing your uh, really absorbing descriptions. I think one of them was just uh, shown in your presentations of really territories that you went out to um to explore right so we're kind of wondering um if you could reflect on how much does the idea of lighting out for the out there uh play a role in your professional practices artists and designers artists slash designers i should say um and also do you consciously build on traditions such as uh, gonzo journalism or travel literature which i personally i think i sort of recognize in your work but i was wondering if this is a conscious move from your side? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I feel like that kind of style of uh, sort of um, writing from like a place of, of, of your personal experience. Um, and um, also writers like John McPhee who kind of have a sort of literary approach to the geological um, art influence. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like, uh, and Ian, jump in whatever, but uh, I feel like for us, we, you know, so many of the things that landscape, like everything touches on is very fraught um, environmentally, politically, socially. And, um, and I think we both 
hold pretty strong opinions about about these things but we really try to like i said like approach these trips and also kind of like materiality and things we work with in our practice with a pretty like open mind about them and just kind of wanting to see and um and i think we that that approach kind of trickles down to um to our design work as well just kind of like wanting to see what things are and um yeah Ian do you want to add yeah I mean like in a lot of ways we approach a trip um it's it's like a site visit you know we're we're looking we're collecting all this data and then we're trusting that uh that the data is going to take us somewhere interesting and it almost always does because everywhere is interesting, <laughs> you know, like as long as you sharpen your lenses a little bit and go somewhere that, that, you know, your family's not also going to, you know, like somewhere off the beaten track a little bit. Um, so I think we've had, uh, yeah, quite a bit of, of fun and also really interesting feedback doing very distinct or, or some really different trips, looking at different things in different places, but always coming, um, it always being a really unique experience because um, I think we're, you know, we're just, just following a, a thread, like following an intellectual thread and then using the kind of like the lenses um, that, you know, of, of architecture to, to decipher it. Yeah. Like going to North Dakota made so much sense to us, but then when we told people we we're going to North Dakota, they're like, no sense to them. <laughs> <laughs> They're like anywhere but Williston. I even had a client tell me that. <laughs> well, and I think, sorry, go ahead. Uh, we have a, a question that just came in from uh, Marcus, uh, which I think it, it ties together both what uh, it looks like what uh, Ian and Colleen were mentioning as well as Giovanna, which was the question is, uh, Giovanna, you just were speaking about um, issues of um, uh, working with others, kind of fiction versus nonfiction. Uh, something that struck me was the way in which uh, your projects seem to be dialogical with the person you're working with, uh, Marcus is saying. So could you speak about uh, where you have disagreements with some of your authors? How do you negotiate that, if at all? And then Marcus also just followed up by asking, uh, Colleen and Ian, given that you two are also kind of working together uh, and it seems dialogical, how do you negotiate conflicts or differences of opinion between the two of you? Mm, can I start with an answering this question? Um, first, Humboldt uh, published some books uh, because I choose to work with a specific photographer, a specific writer. So in that case, I have a, um, I know uh, from the very beginning the work of the artist and what I proposed th them to do a book together. So of course I. I propose something very clear. And in that case, we don't have any fight or whatever discussion. Uh, in other case, of course, uh, we are sponsored by gallery or museum or institution, or maybe artists that won a grant and he would like to publish his own work. My problem is that I think now uh, books as not to be like um, book as not to be like a catalog. So you have to understand that books now have a different meaning. Maybe you do a show and then you do the book about the show, but I think the book has to be something slightly different from the show that can survive also after the opening. It's not like full of uh, installation view and so on. Sometimes the problem with artists or photographers, if they have to publish a book, is that maybe they want to put too much in a book. And I think it's better for the sake of the book to have one or two maximum concepts for the book and then develop the book around these two concepts. When you start adding things, then you, I think you destroy the, the concept and so the, the book itself. The only argument I had with uh, um, our artists was about this, that of course they are scared that it's their first book, so they have to put everything and then the risk was to make a mess. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, for us, like, um, we actually approach things pretty differently, which, which I think is what makes it interesting and like fun for us to collaborate. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of conflict, I mean, I think we just try to put it into the story and like into the work, like in this, like most in the North Dakota trip, I mean, we write about it, like there was like a day where I misplanned and then everyone got, you know, everyone's like mad at each other. Um, and we kind of just try to like incorporate those things because that's what happens on a road trip. And, um, and I think that, within the context of this kind of, uh, especially in North, or the North Dakota trip where there is like this sort of specter of like, um, or disaster tourism too, where I think like uh, we got like the last day we were like stuck in this awful um, traffic jam because they were like rebuilding the roads. And like, there were definitely these kind of moments where we were all kind of upset. And, uh, but I think, yeah, we try to just sort of like have that be part of the data collection. And, and I would add that conflict can be, I think it was actually Colleen pointed this out to me one time talking about her former bosses who were a husband and wife who had a fair bit of conflict. Um, but she would talk about actually how generative conflict can be um, because we are social animals and the way We've, humans have evolved to think in groups that um, that when there's a conflict, um, because we're approaching it from different ways, what what we both land on and decide is is the best way to proceed is is probably at least for for us is indeed the best way to proceed. So I think we we take that um, it help that helps kind of process any kind of like um, issues we had after the fact, of course. Not in the middle of it. <laughs> Um, and perhaps uh, we'd like to go back to Mariana and from the landscapes of uh, imagination and description to the landscape of books that is right now happening in her gallery. So uh, back to you, Mariana. Yes, but if you want to keep going with the, with the conversation, for me, it's, it's fine. I just selected a few uh, books that uh, were mentioned mostly in the magazine. Um, my friends know that I'm a compulsive reader and my very good friends know that I'm a sucker for notes and bibliographies. And uh, because they are like a door or into more authors and more writing and more books. So of course we already mentioned uh, um, Ganges Water Machine and uh, um, Giovanna's book, but uh, we had here a few more. Uh, one is, uh, Felipe Correa's book, uh, Beyond the City, uh, who is also a contributor to the, to the magazine. And uh, a very interesting one also dealing with the American landscape is uh, Archive Style by uh, Robin Kelsey. Um, this just to say that uh, books uh, always put together stories and, and photographs uh, to, to tell a story that, yes, maybe it's true or maybe it's not. Uh, but it's still it's still a compelling story. Um, I don't know if Ian and Colleen um, have somehow turn, tried to turn uh, their trips uh, into into book formats. Uh, it's always challenging for for authors to imagine how how your work can uh, can be can be read by by somebody else. But I do hope personally that they, they will publish their narratives, not only this one, because I find, uh, I find them hilarious also when we didn't speak about that. So it's also, I think, I, I really love the style of, of your writing and not only the sort of documentary evidence that we get. Um, so- uh, And in this, uh, in this regard, I really hope Giovanna will consider translating uh, Giorgio Vasta's book because it is as well, very, very entertaining uh, to read. So it would be nice for the American public to get a chance to, to read it. Translating in French and German, not in English yet. Oh. 
we'll get there. So thank you very much. Uh, I think actually this conversation was uh, in a way profound because uh, in our journal, we not only look at space or architecture or landscape in a traditional sense of an architectural journal, but we, as Anthony mentioned at the beginning, try to sort of weave narratives from uh, various sources. So literary sources, uh, documentary sources of sorts, and you know the geological, uh, a reference world that uh, Ian and Colleen, for instance, bring to the table. And for us, this is all uh, about writing and understanding the Americas in the plural. Um, and I think there's also something that was really nice in the conversation is the optimism that you need to have before you go out on a road trip like that, uh, that I think the three of you mentioned, even though you know that it's not uh, all going to be shining along the road. Um, and it really reminds me of, you know, Keith Richards once said, it's great to be here, but it's great to be anywhere, uh, which, which is a sentence that goes with me for years. But I think in a way it speaks of the, the sort of drive to go out there um, and light out for the territory. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mariana and Spazio for hosting us today. Uh, thank you all for being here with us, and we hope to see you soon in one of our future events. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much.